Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are going to take just a few minutes to allow more people to come onto the webinar. Thank you. Inger, would you like to take things away? Yes. Welcome, everyone, uh, to Jane Austen and Company. I'm happy to introduce you to our fifth event in this uh, 2021 series on race and the Regency. I'm Inga Brody. I'm an associate professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, and I co-direct Jane Austen and Company with um, one of our PhD students, Anne Fertig. Uh, and Jane Austen Company is a subsidiary to the Jane Austen Summer Program. Um, we, uh, the Jane Austen Summer Program runs this and many other literary adventures. Um, and uh, I'm a co-founder and director of the Jane Austen Summer Program. Uh, the Jane Austen Company is a free public humanities series that we host. Um, and tonight we are thrilled to welcome Professor Lyndon Dominique, who will be giving the talk Political Blackness in Women of Color. But before we begin, I'd like to hand um, things over to my colleague and co-host, Dr. Danielle Christmas, to speak some more about what this series means this year. Hello, everyone. My name is Danielle Christmas, and I'm an assistant professor of English and Comparative Literature at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I research and teach about the relationship between cultural production, like Jane Austen's novels, and their socioeconomic context, including the economic politics of slavery. It is this work that has allowed me to co-host this series, Race in the Regency, which will be running through May 2021. The speakers in this series will explore the role of race, nationalism, imperialism, and identity in the works and times of Jane Austen, as well as in literary and film adaptations of the time period. Perhaps you attended my talk on the Zong crisis in Mansfield Park this past February, or joined us for another lecture by any number of the featured speakers we've had the honor of hosting since then. If so, and you are back in anticipation of this entirely different and yet wholly connected scholarly presentation on the racial politics of a work of Regency era fiction, then you already understand the ethos of this series to gather a diverse cross section of intellectual and professional points of view and grow together in conceptualizing what race means for understanding the Regency and what Jane Austen's Regency means for our own complicated notions of race. I know that I speak for all of us when I say how, based on your presence and enthusiastic curiosity thus far, we are thrilled by the prospects of what a series like Race in the Regency has already achieved and can achieve moving forward. So thank you for joining us and welcome back for this fifth event in Race in the Regency featuring Professor Lyndon Dominique. Lyndon Dominique is an Associate Professor of English and Africana Studies at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, where he specializes in 18th century British literature and issues related to critical race studies, colonialism and transatlanticism, gender and social justice. 
He received his BA with honors in comparative American studies from the University of Warwick in Coventry, England, and his PhD in English from Princeton University. He is the editor of the anonymously published 1808 novel, Woman of Color, and the author of a monograph, Amoinda's Shade, Marriage and the African Woman in 18th Century British Literature. Currently, he is working on a book about political blackness and social justice in 18th century Britain. I will now hand things over to our technical director, Emily Sfera, who will explain the procedure for discussion following the lecture. Hi hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we hear from Lyndon, I wanna take a moment to explain how tonight's event will work. The event will last about 90 minutes in total. Throughout and after Lyndon's presentation, you are welcome to put questions for him in the Q&A box. Inger and Danielle will then pose those questions to Lyndon. The Q&A box uh, has two speech bubbles, while the chat box, which many of you have already found, only has one speech bubble. So please don't put questions for Lyndon in the chat box, as you've already seen. We will likely have a lively conversation in the chat throughout the entire event. So if you really want your question to be seen, please put it in the Q&A box. Um, if you would prefer not to see the chat, unfortunately, we cannot turn off notifications completely, but you can make sure that the box is out of your screen by clicking on the red dot in the left-hand corner. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you, Emily. And please note everyone that tonight's program will be recorded. We will notify you all via Facebook um, and the website when it's available to view. Um, and with, without further ado, we'll hand things over to Lyndon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Inga, Emily, and um, Anne, and Danielle, uh, for what's a wonderful uh, presentation, wonderful um, welcome for me. Um, and thank you for everybody who made this event happen. Um, I'm really honored to be able to come and speak to you here today about the woman of color, a text that I've, I've engaged with for such a long period of time, and I, I love talking about it. So I'm really interested in hearing your questions at the end of the talk. I'm just gonna share my screen with you for a second. Okay. So I want to begin my talk to the, talk about political blackness in The Woman of Color with a brief mention of a topic that on its surface couldn't be further removed from today's focus on race, the Regency period, and the long 18th century. It's a topic that has consumed way too much of my free time. And since 2016, it's a topic that has tested the patience of not only the entire British nation, but most countries on the European continent and even some beyond. This topic, of course, is Brexit. And I'm sure you will know, on, as I'm sure you will know, on January the 1st of this year, Britain left the European Union, and it's been nothing short of an exhausting journey to get to this point. But I'm going to briefly tax your patience today and raise the topic of Brexit once again, because I'm interested in some of the popular discourse that it has elicited. Over the last few years, it's been surprising to see abolitionist discourse being regularly bandied about in the popular British press. For instance, in November of 2019, a Bloomberg tax headline states that, quote, Michael Gove made it a central part of his recent Conservative Party leadership campaign that VAT would be abolished after Brexit. For resisting Brexit and voting against the measure, a Daily Express headline asks, could the House of Lords be abolished? And one of the most popular abolitionist proclamations heard during this time is captured in this headline from, of all places, the magazine Good Housekeeping, which triumphantly asserts tampon tax abolished. At the core of all of this popular abolitionist rhetoric is a pervasive, consistent message. Britons, it seems, never, never, never shall be slaves to an EU master. And in a desperate fit to abolish the EU's control, restore British sovereignty and boost national pride, Britons appear to be willing to go all out to consider abolishing anything, taxes, the upper political chamber, all in the name of freedom from a, a European tyrant who cruelly decides the shape of bananas and denies women the right to buy cheap sanitary products. But there's a very serious side to this sometimes ludicrous abolitionist rhetoric appearing in the nation's press. Amidst the dubious sense of national pride and progress that this Brexit rhetoric has drummed up, 
I've been wondering what role blackness will play in a post-Brexit Britain where European tyranny has been abolished and Britons are ostensibly more free. And recently I got an answer. The 258 page race report published by the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities and requested by Boris Johnson in the wake of last year's Black Lives Matter protest was released last week to much disdain and mass incredulity for its range of abolitionist arguments. Some of, its, some of its recommendations involve ending the use of the term BAME, an acronym which stands for Black, Asian and Minority Ethnicity, ending a focus on the slave period as an era of profit and suffering, and perhaps most outrageously, abolishing the idea that Britain is an institutionally racist country. As Tony Sewell, the report's chairperson puts it, quote, we no longer see a Britain where the system is deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities. One wonders if Meghan Markle might agree. In terms of its timing, however, the Sewell, Sewell report and its serious abolitionist recommendations can be read in tandem with the more ludicrous abolitionist discourse brought on by Brexit and banded about in the national press. Sewell, a black education expert, leads a panel of eight other ethnic minorities charged with producing an independent report about post-Brexit blackness that sends a clear message. Not only has a sexist tax on tampons been ab abolished, but racism has been abolished too. Bravo. I begin today's talk with this preface about the Sewell Race Report and the way its publication aligns with popular abolitionist discourse in the, in the contemporary British press, because they contribute simultaneously to dubious notions of freedom and nationalism in a post-Brexit Britain. But where we might laugh at the ludicrous abolitionist discourse surrounding bananas and tampons, it's no laughing matter when an official report makes abolitionist recommendations and politicizes blackness in a way that may be more in the service of supporting and maintaining systems of oppression for black people than undoing them. This is not the case for the woman of color, however, a text which appears during another period of abolitionist euphoria in Britain's history. Published in 1808, one year after the abolition of the British slave trade, I read the woman of color as a direct reaction to the euphoric discourse that abolition engendered in the period between March 1807, when the abolition was ratified in parliament and October 1808, when the first advertisements for the novel appear. However, in terms of its timing, I think that this novel is more politically astute and progressive than Sewell's race report in the way it situates itself within its post-abolitionist moment in the nation's history by its nuanced and unique engagement with the discourses of slavery, abolition, and women's rights, but also, as I'll discuss today, in its pointed awareness of various kinds of blackness and the ways that blackness can be politicized within the post-abolitionist moment. So today, I wanna to talk about political blackness in The Woman of Color, and I'm going to do so using some terms that are found in the Sewell Race Report, but in the way that this, that's distinct from it. These terms, heroes, rebels, and participation, will provide a loose framework for my examinations of some of the moments within the novel where I think blackness is being politicized. And it'll also serve as a vehicle for, dis for distinguishing between the women of color, Olivia and Dido, who politicize blackness throughout the text. I'll conclude by summarizing what I think about these women and why I think using them to talk about political blackness in the woman of color is important for us today. Although the Sewell Report attempts to establish a new way of thinking about blackness in post-Brexit Britain, it does so by co-opting an older set of terms that I find useful and want to adapt as an anchor for my talk about the woman of color and my thoughts about political blackness within it. Sewell, Sewell's report states, poet and activist Linton Cressy Johnson describes the early mass black experience in the UK as having two phases or eras. The first was the 1950s Windrush arrival from the Caribbean. This he called the heroic period, when literally doors were closed in the faces of the new black settlers who heroically battled in the face of adversity. The children of those settlers, my generation, who came of age in the 1970s and 80s, he calls the rebel generation. This featured running battles with police and a breakdown in community relations, which continues to have a negative legacy. But this report speaks to a new period, which we have described as the era of participation. We can only speak of participation if we acknowledge that the UK has fundamentally shifted since those periods in the past and has become a more open society. Here Sewell uses Linton Questy Johnson's terms, heroes and rebels, 
as a historical foundation upon which to establish a new term, participation, which he and the other authors of the report used to describe blackness in this post-Brexit moment. Participation, as they appear to define it, marks a significant shift away from the past of black heroes and rebels and a political recognition that black people are now playing a more active role in post-Brexit post post Britain, one that's not defined by battling adversity or a need to stage protest. But their notion that an era of participation means divorcing contemporary black people from the black British past risks erasing not only the historical fact that black people have been participants in British culture for centuries, but also diminishes the existence of black heroes and rebels that existed well before the 1950s. For instance, can't we think of Alada Equiano as a hero to Otoba Cuguano's rebel in the 18th century, or Mary Seacole's heroine to Mary Prince's rebel in the 19th century? And whether heroes or rebels, haven't all of these 18th and 19th century black people in Britain participated in what they thought was a more open British society? Aren't the texts which feature their experiences of black people in British empire written to determine how open and or closed British society is? So instead of using Johnson's formulation about heroes and rebels to support what I believe is the Sewell, Sewell's report, the Sewell report's attempt to erase the historical connection between black British heroes and rebels from the past, I want to use this language as a way of shifting the historical idea of political blackness further back in history to formulate some questions and perhaps a new reading of The Woman of Color and its importance as a seminal black British text. In the plot of this novel, as many of you know, the heroine Olivia Fairfield stumbles, so sublimates what she calls her, quote, rebellious and repining heart to travel from Jamaica to England to participate in British culture and a marriage plot arranged by her dead father's will. In England, she must marry her first cousin, Augustus Merton, a man who is described incestuously as the quote, image of her father. This marriage is eventually nullified when Augustus's first wife, Angelina, reappears. Cast aside, Olivia receives and rejects the proposal of, of Charles Honeywood, the man who adores her. But the novel ends with Olivia rebelling against the whole idea of marriage, consigning herself a widow for life and leaving England for an unknown Jamaican future. It's important to note that she's not kicked out of the country, it's her choice to leave. But I'm interested in the fact that this anonymous author who has spent considerable time building up Olivia's heroic brand of black femininity by showing how she participates in British culture and heroically navigates a marriage pot that she didn't choose, ultimately, decides that once Olivia rejects marriage and identifies as a rebellious independent black woman, she can no longer find a home within British society, but must leave for her original home in the British empire. Does this mean that England cannot be a place where blackness can be validated, not even the attractive form of blackness that Olivia displays? With the independent and rebellious black heroine removed to Jamaica at the end of her text, and in my dreams fighting to abolish slavery there, the questions that I want to address today are about the blackness that Olivia has worked so hard to validate in the woman of color and the role that it plays after 1808, but within a post-abolitionist Regency Britain. Does the novel suggest that blackness cannot play a continued role within Britain in Olivia's absence? If it can, what's the, sp the specific legacy about blackness that Olivia and the novel's author leave for future blacks consigned to live on British shores? Should blackness continue to participate in British culture, even though Olivia's departure seems to suggest that it's not wanted there? And with Johnson's formulation and Sewell's race report in mind, I ask, is the woman of color advocating for a notion of heroic black participation in British culture, or is it rebelling against this notion? My reading of the novel today touches on many of these questions. And I wanna start by considering the anonymous author's active participation in promoting political blackness. We see our first indications of this when we consider the title, The Woman of Color. Now, this title is as vague as it is specific. It's a story about a woman of color, but a woman of what color specifically? Is she a Creole, Mulatto, Octoroon, Quadroon, Musty, Hexadecaroon? I had to look that one up, that's one sixteenth black. Is she tawny, swarthy, dusky? This list of possible racial classifications and complexions isn't exhaustive, but it's very diverse. And it's clear to me at least that the author uses this title to include many, many permutations of blackness 
in its, in its strategically vague reference to only one of them. So even before Olivia appears in the text then, the author makes sure that readers know Olivia is a representative of a whole slew of possible black subjectivities that are politicized because they each evoke some type of proximity to whiteness. The anonymous author's active participation in promoting political blackness can also be seen at the level of plot. For it's clear that uncertainty about the role blackness plays in post-abolitionist Britain is a significant part of the novel's plot from the very beginning. As Olivia crosses the Atlantic and prior to her arrival at Bristol, the author involves her in a conversation with Mrs. Honeywood, the maternal figure who takes Olivia under her wing. In this middle passage setting, Olivia tells her traveling companion, in England, in my father's native country, he deemed that a more liberal, a more distinguishing spirit had gone abroad. Dear Mrs. Milbank, I thought a skeptical expression overspread the marked countenance of Mrs. Honeywood. This quote puts Mr. Fairfield's optimistic belief in England's more liberal and distinguishing spirit in stark contrast with Mrs. Honeywood's skeptical expression drawn presumably from her long residence there. Between this hopeful yet deceased paternal optimist and a living maternal skepticist lies Olivia, the test subject whose journey to England would prove one or the other of these parental positions right. This strategically staged family scene is the reason why I think the anonymous author is politicizing Olivia from the very beginning. When it comes to Olivia's future in England, who knows best? The optimistic father who has financially benefited from his residence in a Jamaica far removed from his native country, or the skeptical mother who knows firsthand how financially volatile life in England can be for even the best of white mothers. The anonymous author's focus on a liberal distinguishing spirit pervading the country makes me think of the quote, more open society that Sewell, that Sewell report mentions as a hallmark of post-Brexit Britain. But unlike that later report, the woman of color's author is not using Olivia and her participation in the spirit of national change to pretend that institutional racism is over or to divorce slavery and suffering from the creation of Olivia's burgeoning black British identity. Rather, Olivia's appearance on British soil is the anonymous author providing an opportunity for readers to observe how progressive this country is in the wake of the abolitionist moment. Will Olivia continue the spirited fight against prejudice that the country has already embarked on? Or will she, con or will she confirm that that liberal distinguishing spirit is a fraud? The woman of color's author leaves both of these possibilities open as it asks us to, to consider how hospitable Britain is to blackness. On the first page of the novel, Olivia tells us that she's actually olive complexioned. And it's at this point that Olivia starts talking about her own blackness, when, when she starts talking about her own blackness, that we see the anonymous author step back and allow Olivia's active and heroic participation in political blackness to do its work within this epistolary text. For instance, Olivia acknowledges her own olive skinned affinity with quote, the swarthiest Negro that was ever brought from Guinea's coast, all, all are brethren. Using the pointed and, and polite religious discourse of brethren, Olivia validates enslaved blackness by bringing it within the religious fold that she, as a privileged woman of color, is already a confirmed member. Olivia is using her privileged and less pronounced blackness here to widen the field of religious acceptance for all people, even the swarthiest ones brought from West Africa, and not just the ones with some proximity to whiteness, as the author's title initially suggests. It's definitely heroic work to nullify stigmas associated with enslaved black people by openly, openly aligning with them and including them as part of a religious family. But we also see Olivia doing the heroic work of political blackness when we consider the language she uses to describe people of African descent at the beginning of the text. She writes, we are considered, dear Mrs. Milbank, as an inferior race, but little removed from the brutes because the almighty maker of all created beings, created beings has tinged our skin with jet instead of ivory. I say our, for though the jet has been faded to the olive in my own complexion, Yet I am not ashamed to acknowledge my affinity with the swarthiest Negro that has, never, that has ever been brought from Guinea's coast. And in the next sentence, she goes on to describe her mother's complexion as a sable covering and her mother's soul as breaking through the gloom of night. In these quotes, it's notable that Olivia's talking about blackness without ever using the term blackness, blackness or black. 
Rather, we get to see a wide range of alternative black expressions. Uh, her, alternative black expressions, sorry. Um, her use of jet brings to mind Afro Ben's description of, of Orinoco's black skin as a perfect ebony or polished jet. And her use of sable and brought brings to mind Phyllis Wheatley's poem on being brought from Africa to America, specifically the line, some view our sable race with scornful eye, which is the same sentiment that Libya is expressing in her quote about the way blackness is seen by some white British people. So from her use of various key terms about blackness that have allusions to texts where black characters are centered, we can conclude that Libya is participating in a literary discourse about blackness that stretches back over a century. But it's also surprising and quite strategic when we consider how and when Olivia chooses to use the term black in a deliberate manner. For instance, in the beginning, Olivia tells us that her nemesis, Mrs. Merton, would be thought pretty by any person who looks for feature only. She is very fair and very fat. Her eyes are the lightest blue. Her cheeks exhibit a most beautiful, but I am apt to believe not natural, carmine. Her hair is flaxen. Her teeth are a dazzling white, and her hand and arm would rival alabaster. This description shows Mrs. Merton with all the concomitants of white beauty. But by the end of the novel, Olivia takes it upon herself to repeatedly describe Mrs. Merton in decidedly black terms, writing, I fear she, Mrs. Merton, has played a black part in order to rob me of that fortune which I did not value. Olivia's suspicions about Mrs. Merton's involvement in her financial downfall are confirmed when Letitia produced, quote, proofs of her guilt in letters Augustus has transmitted for Olivia's perusal. But it's notable that uh, Olivia does not retranscribe these letters uh, for Mrs. Milbank, instead telling her, I cannot transcribe so black a scene of guilt. Um, and finally, on page 177, she says, a train of revenge was laid by Mrs. Merton as black as it proved successful. By the end of the text then, Letitia Merton's extremely white beauty is aggressively overlaid by a vengeful, indescribable, diabolical blackness that is so bad it cannot be repeated for others to see. That Olivia is repeatedly and strategically identifying this diabolical blackness in a white woman is strategic. As the, as the time approaches for her to, de, to depart for Jamaica, Olivia's references to Mrs. Merton's blackness are actively making readers aware of a more damaging threat to the nation's core, the blackness at the heart of some white British people. This focus on blackness at the heart of white, Brit, white, white people is a deliberate political strategy to make readers think more comprehensively about the spectrum of blackness in Britain that extends beyond the pale of people of African descent. Another way in which Olivia heroically participates in political blackness is through her own distinctive performance of it. It's worth noting that The Woman of Color is published at a time when Roxanne Wheeler believes that skin color is a fixed and is a fixed predominant category of difference. Saying this, Wheeler means that during the latter part of the 18th century, skin color became the primary means by which individuals distinguished themselves from each other. Before that, Wheeler's, Wheeler's, Wheeler argues in her book, The Complexion of Race, that other categories of difference, clothing, religion, climate, geographic location, played a greater part than skin color in how people distinguish themselves from each other. Moreover, she contends that this emphasis on other categories of, categories of difference allowed some individuals to be read as white, even though they were phenotypically black. Recently, Katie Child's book, Transformable Race, has built on Wheeler's formulations by discussing Alada Equiano's interesting narrative and a scene in which a male Indian observer compares the obviously black skin Afri African Equiano to other white men serving on board a ship. The, this Indian sailor asked Equiano, how comes it that all the white men on board who can read and write and observe the sun and owe all things yet swear and lie and get drunk only accepting yourself? Charles reads this as a moment where the Indian, where the Indian thinks of Equiano as white, not because of his appearance, but because of the things Equiano does. Her reading offers an explicit example that concepts like blackness and whiteness were a lot more fluid than we might understand them today, and that there's a more complex way of reading and understanding what we think of as racialized black body during this time. 
even as late as 1857, Mary Seacole defines herself as a Creole with good Scotch blood coursing through her veins, adding that many people have also traced to my Scotch blood that energy and activity which are not always found in the Creole race and which have carried me to so many varied scenes and perhaps they are right. Just as Equiano's behavior makes him white to an Indian observer, Seacole speculates that her roving disposition makes her, Scotch makes her Scotch irrespective of her skin color, which she says is, quote, only a little brown, uh, a few shades duskier than the brunette you all, so, you all admire so much. My point here is that actual living black British writers in the eight, late, late 18th and mid 19th century like Seacole and Equiano are being read as white or Scotch despite their black and brown skin colors. And the olive skinned fictionalized Olivia who identifies with the swarthiest Guinea Negro at one point, but in another considers herself as more than half an English woman is also displaying this racial elasticity in the woman of color. I think that Olivia's racial elasticity has a distinct connection to political blackness. I see this happening in that great scene, and I hope we get to talk about this scene, uh, involving little George and his attempts to wash the dirt off Olivia's skin. During this scene, little George complains that Dido, Olivia's black maid, has been trying to kiss him, and in the process, he believes that she has dirtied his face as if her blackness is transferable. transferable. By allowing George to rub her skin, thereby proving for himself that her skin color is stable and not filthy, Olivia allows George to learn that blackness is a fixed category of difference. But in this scene, it's Olivia's actions that politically align her with British whites. Her patient religious instruction of George, a religious education that his mother, Mrs. Merton, does not try to attempt, not only transforms George into a future Englishman who understands how race works and what blackness is, it also shows that the woman of color's values are aligned with white Britons. Heroically, Olivia has saved at least one future Englishman from prejudice by bringing him in line with the British values that she herself embodies. And considering them together, Seacole, Equiano, and Olivia show that they uphold the same values as the British and that their elastic expressions of blackness belong there and should be included within the society because they're each capable of, capable of being read as British in values and disposition, despite their differing skin colors. But there are also some limitations associated with this heroic manner in which Olivia participates in political blackness. We see this when it comes to her appearance at the Merton Ball. If you remember that scene, these macaroni men come up to Olivia and racially berate her to her face, calling her Gusty's black princess. And although Olivia does manage to heroically undermine these men by calling them animals, it's what she's not able to say in that scene that shows the limitations of Olivia's participation in political blackness. She can call them animals in her letters to Mrs. Milbank, but in the actual moment when that public act of racism appears, she has to take their criticism silently and potentially stew until she's able to pick up a pen. This blatantly racist Merton Ball incident involving Olivia's silencing can be read in relation to Equiano's silent acceptance of the bishop who received him with much condescension and politeness, but from certain scruples of delicacy declined to ordain him when he wanted to become a missionary. And Mary Seacole's mute appeal as she sits and waits and can, is continually ignored in her quest to become a nurse during the Crimean War. Despite their obvious expressions of British values and dispositions that are associated with British whiteness, these characters, real and imaginary, hit a brick wall when it comes to racism. But still, they persevere through that adversity. It's as if they brush off racism and move on. And it's this optimistic participation in the face of overt racism that I find a heroic, yet also a, pretty, a potentially dangerous expression of political blackness. In the mid 20th century, Sam Selvon's novel, The Lonely Londoners, describes Moses being brought to tears by his inability to shirk off the psychological effect of racism in Britain. And later in the 1970s, Michael Abentet's play, Sweet Talk, documents the way in which a couple's engagement with racism leads them both towards insanity. 
So I'm wondering if, despite being actively involved in polit politicizing a spectrum of blackness that can include white people, uh, making Olivia a spokesperson for a whole variety of black people and showing that blackness belongs in Britain, the woman of color and Olivia's heroic participation in its political blackness is at once progressive, but dangerous because it encourages participation in British society without considering the trauma of racism on the body and more specifically, the toll that racism takes on the participating black British body. But despite Olivia's limitations, it's important to remember that, uh, that if she's the novel's main protagonist, but she isn't alone in her fight for validation, black recognition and participation in British society. She has an accomplice. I'd like to talk to end this talk by discussing in some detail. The other woman of African descent in this novel that I hope critics will pay more attention to, Dido. Dido is a really intriguing character because I can't think of uh, another plot in British literature that contains such an extensive portrayal of a Jamaican heiress of color bringing an enslaved woman of African descent to England with her as a servant in the wake of the 1772 Mansfield Judgment. As many of you know, the Mansfield Judgment circulated the myth that slavery had been abolished on British shores. The fact that Olivia has no qualms about bringing the enslaved Dido to a country where the populace believes slavery doesn't exist suggests that she has a very different connection to money and human property than we normally would expect from a Jamaican slaveholder who might be more concerned about losing labor on the Jamaican plantation. We get an indication that Olivia has a completely different understanding of the relation between money and human property when we consider another one of her rare uses of the term black. At the end of the text, she uses this term to draw attention to Dido's eyes, uh, calling them black orbs sparkling like diamonds. If eyes are the windows of the soul, then Dido's orbs harbor a precious inner disposition. And we even see this idea of an enslaved black woman's precious in inner disposition expressed earlier in the text when Olivia's, Olivia describes her mother's soul, which though shrouded in sable, sable covering, broke through the gloom of night and shone celestial in her sparkling eyes. Marcia's and Dido's sparkling and celestial inner dispositions are also accompanied by outer ones, where Marcia sparkles as quote, not almost, but altogether a Christian. Dido's body sparkles with those large gold earrings that she puts on just before she arrives in England. It's this language associated with Olivia's observations about Dido's inner and outer worth that lead me to conclude that Olivia sees and values Dido's body in ways that are well beyond the monetary system in which Jamaican slaves are normally valued and prized. Olivia's observations about Dido's sparkling inner and outer bo black body rebels against the notion that enslaved black bodies in Britain are tied to monetary value and instead deliberately ties this formerly enslaved black woman to standards that are measured in gold and precious jewels. But Dido's participation in political blackness is not completely dependent on, on Olivia's observations about her black body in England. Dido actively participates in political blackness on her own when she tells Olivia, Mrs. Merton's maid treats me as if me was her slave and Dido was never slave, but to her own dear Missy. And she was proud of that. Here, it's Dido's use of was in the past tense, which suggests that she understands that in England, she isn't a slave anymore based on the myth of the Mansfield judgment. Just as Olivia is charged with being a representative for blackness in the post abolitionist moment, Dido is charged with being an expression of the Mansfield judgment and its spirit and the spirit of its mandate that slaves are free once they appear on British soil. Dido acknowledges that her body has value beyond its enslaved condition in England. And the fact that she articulates this in Olivia's text suggests that she's rebelling against the idea that her enslavement continues after she leaves Jamaica. Dido's verbal cues offer perhaps some of the clearest examples of her participation in political blackness when we arrive at the part of the plot when Olivia's marriage to Augustus crumbles due to the machinations of Mrs. Merton. Oh, accursed, accursed wretches, says Dido. I'll go back, sorry. Accursed, cursed wretches, says Dido. They that contrive so black a plot. In this example, Dido seems to be using blackness just as Olivia does to indicate evil done by white people. 
but she calls them out, repeating that word, curses, curses, a word used to express strong dislike of or anger toward someone or something. Olivia's references to Mrs. Milbank's diabolical blackness seem pretty mild when compared to Dido's repeated curses, where black respectability politics and politeness make Olivia hold back her feelings during the Merton Ball, and when transcribing Mrs. Merton's egregious behavior, Dido's curses indicate that her feelings have no polite filter. Then Dido goes on to make two references to black people of African descent in this same scene, saying, my poor Missy was happy in our own dear Jamaica. Not the blackie of them all would have touched one sacred hair of her head, but in the way of reverence and affection. And then in another outburst, she cries, they, meaning white people, think that the poor blacks have no hearts, but I believe that they have more heart and soul too than some of the whites. God help them, God help them all. In the first quote, the reference to a blackie of them all refers to the black people on, on the Fairfield's plantation, we presume, who observe the child Olivia growing up and only view her with reverence and affection. But in the second quote, her use of some of the whites, some of the whites makes me once again think of um, Wheatley's poem on being brought from Africa to America. And that same line that Olivia evoked earlier, some view our sable race with scornful eye, their color is a diabolic dye. Dido seems to be alluding to Wheatley here when she uses the pronoun they to refer to those white people who view poor blacks as having no hearts. And her repeated reference to hearts also has a distinctly black British connection. In a letter written by the noted black British epistolary writer, Ignatius Sancho, he advises his friend to quote, make human nature thy study wherever thou reside, whatever the religion or the complexion, study their hearts, end quote. This is exactly what Dido is doing when she focuses twice on the hearts of black and white people. So far from being merely a figure of comic humor who uses pidgin English then, Dido's participation in and expressions of black dialect, dialect offer rich literary, literary illusions filled with possibility. In addition, these quotes also identify two moments in the text where she's actually using the common term to refer to people of African descent without the more polite language of jet, sable, swarthy, mulatto, or all the illusions that the woman of color's title conveys. She simply identifies people of African descent as black, where Olivia uses the discourse of religious brethren and multiple various ways of defining blackness, Dido goes straight to the source. She's rebelling against refinement, both in her feelings about whites and her acknowledgement of blacks. But it's Dido's involvement in Olivia's marriage plot that I think shows her participating in political blackness in perhaps her most rebellious manner. When Olivia's marriage is annulled uh, and she is consigned to live in Monmouthshire, it's notable that Dido's complexion changes. My poor Dido looked wan and dispirited, Olivia tells Mrs. Milbank, and, I, and that I attributed to the effects of her zealous and arduous exertions for me. And then all of a sudden, Dido's dispossession suddenly changes for the better. Today, she's all cheerful hilarity. We discover that this sudden change in disposition arises because Dido has been communicating with Mr. Honeywood and is certain that by bringing him together with Olivia, that they'll get married and both she and Olivia will remove themselves from that small house that Dido hates. Ah, Missy, Missy, she tells Olivia, tapping her cheek with her hand. Mr. Honeywood's house be your own house if you do like it. We do know it be, we do know it be. She continues, it be like the dear Fairfield Plantation. Yes, yes, and me shall be housekeeper again and have my bunch of keys at my own side. My students tend to read Dido here as implicated in Olivia's oppression by trying to arrange another marriage for her after her disastrous marriage to Augustus ends. But after thinking this through, I'm coming to the conclusion that Dido's actually establishing a suitable home for blackness like Olivia's and her own to thrive, to thrive in within Britain. Her focus on participating in the big British house where blackness of all kinds can be integrated and validated is just as important a recognition of blackness than anything Olivia says about it because it rebelliously, rebelliously acknowledges that blackness deserves its rightful place in British society, whether Britons like it or not. So to conclude, what I hope you've heard today is that there are two black women 
who participate in political blackness in the woman of color. Olivia heroically does things like bring, bringing enslaved Africans into the fold, re-educating young Englishmen, and reproducing a much wider spectrum of blackness in ways that distinguish black beauty and expose white evil. But her participation in political blackness also seems dangerous because it encourages participation in British society without considering the trauma of racism on the body. And Dido rebelliously participates in political blackness through her connections to the mantle judgment, her refusal to, to think of herself as a slave in England, and her refusal to conform to standardized and polite language and action. But it's her desire to establish a big house in Britain where blackness reigns that I think is her transformative legacy. By participating in the marriage plot between Olivia and Honeywood, Daito imagines a version of Bridgerton 200 years before it appears, her version of political blackness, the idea that blackness has a right to remain and establish a home in Britain might be the greatest gift that Dido gives to British readers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's stop the share if we can. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lyndon. Uh, we already have some uh, interesting questions from our, our attendees here. Um, so uh, start with a question from Kathy. What was the, uh, the, what can you tell us about the reception of this book um, when it first came out in England? So, so it, it was a very quiet reception. Um, and, and if there are any graduate students, I, I want to, 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 to really encourage you to do the work that you want to do because um, um, uh, when I first did, wrote on The Woman of Color, I remember going to I6 and presenting at I6 and I think I had four people in the room during oh, the oh no. It's a big crowd, right, for a graduate student. But, <laughs> but I wasn't first. And so um, two of the people got up and left after the first paper. And so I, was, so I only had two, a, a crowd of two. The reception to The Woman of Color <laughs> was, was nothing because nobody had heard about it at that particular time. Um, uh, but, but, but once it came out, I must admit, once it started circulating, um, the reception has been, has been great. Um, uh, Sarah Sally did a, a review of it and, and wrote about it in her book. Um, and, and since that time, I think more people have just been aware of this text that was, that was out there. Um, and so I, I, I'm just saying, saying this all to say that, that, you know, do the work that you want to do, even if they don't come to your panels, keep it going and, um, and ho hopefully people will read it and, and get to love it. How was the reception back in, in uh, when it first came out in the, in the UK? That was that was the that was the issue. I mean, when it first came out in the UK. Okay. Oh, I mean, the in in 1806. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So the, the reception. I'm so so sorry. So so as I say in the book, the um the the when it first came out, the there were there were three um, reviews of this book, which is which is unusual, right? Um, three actually extensive reviews of this book at, at this particular time. So so the reception was quite interesting that people had heard about it. Um, they weren't actually encouraged about it, and, and they, they, like in my reading today, seem to be privileging Dido, but for very different reasons, right? They, they wanted to privilege Dido in one of the, um, one of the uh, reviews, privileges Dido because she fulfills their idea of the kind of mammy figure, right? Um, um, but, and, and I think Olivia is too threatening. Um, but, but the fact that there are three reviews says to me that this, this text was read by a number of people. And as I say in the introduction is also, it was a member of, um, it was a, 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 an addition in the circulating library. So I'd like to see those ledgers to find out how many people were actually taking it out, right? And, and, and reading it along those lines. But the fact that it is this, in this circulating and subscribing library says that it had a wide, wider circulation than I possibly could imagine. That's wonderful, thank you. We have a question here. Were there significant differences, differences, excuse me, between the experiences of women of color and men of color? Were men of color over-sexualized in popular culture in England the way they were in the US? That's a really, really good question. And it's, a, it's an excellent question. And, and the, the, the only, the, the, you know, I, I don't have a, I, I, I'm trying to think of a frame of reference to, to kind of pull that question up. Um, the, 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 Text that I that I know about this time, uh, texts like uh, Equiano, Cuguano, those from the Black British tradition, um, 
are all about men who are, seem to be of African descent. And so I, I don't know if there are, there are texts about men of color uh, that are as, as extensive as the woman of color. So I have to say that, that I'm not sure, right? But if I was to answer this question in relation to the text that I know, like Equiano's text, um, Equiano never mentions his body as a kind of sexualized subject. In fact, he kind of sublimates his sexual desire in initial, um, in initial publication, uh, his desire for, for the woman who ends up being his wife, right? It just seems like he's, he's not interested in putting that stuff out here because he doesn't want to offend people. And probably he didn't want to do it because it's, um, it's also, you know, he's also such a Christian, such a bona fide Christian in this particular time. So, so I'm saying all this to say that I, I don't think I can answer your question as, as you would like to answer it, but, but, um, but, but I would say that if there is a text out there, I, I just haven't read it. <laughs> that, that focuses on men of color, I just haven't read it. Interesting. Um, and so a couple of people have already been asking the, the big question of, of who wrote this text and, <laughs> and uh, what, um, you know, what kind of evidence do we have for it being a woman or for it being a West Indian or what, what, what do you think? See, so, so this is the, the great question. And as I've always told my students, you know, um, I'm waiting for Oprah to call. If I ever find out, Oprah will call me and, uh, and you know, my, my life will be made. Um, you know, I, I, have, I, I had some leads um, um, uh, sort of that I, that I identified in the, in the beginning of the, of the text. So Anne Maitland was a lead. Um, and in fact, a, a descendant of Anne Maitland um, ended up emailing me and I need to email her back. Um, uh, because she was surprised that um, that 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 her her foreparent um, could have been the, the kind of inspiration for the woman of color. Um, I have no inf I have no evidence whatsoever that is written by a person of color, aside from the fact, as I've talked about today, that the the ways in which this this novel is in engaging with blackness seem to be so different from anything else I've read at this particular time, right? The focus on the woman of color. I'm not saying that a white writer couldn't do it, but, but those little touches, the, the fact that, that, that Dido puts on those earrings before she gets to England, right? To, to kind of decorate her body. The fact that she calls her eyes black orbs sparkling like diamonds, right? Um, that the, this, says that, that this says to me that the language is, is, is aware of its need to redefine the way in which the enslaved body has been seen. And I'm not saying that a white writer couldn't do that. I'm just saying that I haven't seen that in other texts where white writers are creating black bodies. You know, there's something different about this. It feels different. Yeah. Um, and so I have no proof aside from the fact that the text seems to be suggesting many things that lead me to believe that it's written by a person of color. The other thing is, um, Olivia's self-awareness, you know, her knowledge of her own um, mulatto identity and how it's perceived in English culture. Um, that awareness is, is very different from some other texts where um, people are kind of, um, I'm thinking of Erika, right, where an awareness of her blackness in, um, in, in French society is the thing that undoes her. Um, uh, for Olivia, her awareness of her of way her blackness is, is perceived in, in English society is the thing that ennervens her, that, that emboldens her to, to go out and, and, and be who she wants to be in this society. So, so I, I have no evidence for who wrote it. Um, I'm still trying to find out. I, I, I actually hoped by now that some graduate students would be out there trying to find out for themselves and you would save me the thing. I don't mind if Oprah calls you. I just want someone to find out who, who wrote it. <laughs> That's very exciting. But what about the other part, the being a woman? So, so again, um, I, I'm thinking of um, the, the, the men who were writing at this particular time. Um, uh, I just, I, 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 t there's something about the relationship between this woman and the other woman in the text that leads me to believe there's a sensitivity associated with that. Um, um, a, a marriage plot that, is, that is, is conscious about the ways in which women's bodies are enslaved, not only in marriage, but, but also within, the, within slavery, right? Um, if we're thinking about intersectionality at this particular time, she's thinking about the ways in which Olivia's body is at once operating in two very, very discrete discourses, the discourse of slavery and the discourse of marriage and how they are both oppressive. And, and to me, the, the, the ability to bring those two discourses together, right? 
is more along the lines of somebody like a, 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 a kind of somebody who, who, a woman who's experienced this, uh, a woman who understands the way in which um, marriage oppresses women, but a woman who is perhaps looking at the ways in which white women are getting married and their expectations and saying, well, that's not my story. Let me tell you how my story is, is a whole lot different than all of these other stories, Pamela included, that are talking about women getting married at this particular time. So, so again, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, up, it's up there. It could be somebody who's enlightened. I'm just saying that there's something about it that leads me to believe that it's a woman. Is it a surprise that the author isn't known? Uh, the questioner says, I realize people, particularly women, wrote anonymously, but were most revealed over time, perhaps at death, if not before. Yeah. Um, it, it's a surprise to me. Um, and it's a surprise to me only because um, this text was in the British Library. It had, they had one copy when I went there as a graduate student. And, um, and that if that one copy had gone, the woman of color would have been lost. And this is the, this is the true story. Like there was, there was one copy. And so as a graduate student, I thankfully had enough money to make a microfilm copy at that particular time um, and, and, and to, to kind of preserve it. Um, but what I'm saying here is, is that the texts are just laying there all, for all that particular time. And I was you know, surprised that nobody had been there thinking, you know, who is this? But, but I have to give props to a woman called uh, Jennifer DeVere Brody and her book, Impossible Purities, which was the, which has brought the woman of color to my attention that particular time. And I just happened to be at the British Library, you know, and, 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 and managed to discover the copy of it. So I'll say this to say that I'm surprised that over 200 years, nobody has picked up this novel and realized just how important it is as, as an insight into a black woman's subjectivity. Uh, in the early 19th century. It was I was just really surprised that that hasn't happened. But given the interest in the novel, especially the recent interest and the focus on sort of race in the Red Renaissance, the race in the Regency period, I'm hoping that there's gonna be more people going out there, working on the novel, trying to find out who wrote it, trying to find out all these connections that the novel has. Um, and maybe that somebody will find, out, find it out eventually. It's the sort of moment that makes you a little scared about what may still be lost in the archives or what is already gone. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, yeah. Do you have? Um, uh, well, so do you have an opinion on 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 uh, why? And this is more about Dido's portrayal. Um, I know my students when we read it reacted to uh, reacted against Dido's portrayal, thinking of it as being excessively stereotypical and a bit degrading. Yes. But you, it seems like you actually uh, find more um, positivity in that. Can you just maybe say a little bit more about whether, in what way, it's stereotypical or not? Yeah, it's it's stereotypical because she speaks in dialect. It's stereotypical because she's always dancing and happy and this, that, and the other. You know, she's, you can read her as a stereotypical mammy figure, right? Uh, it's very easy to do that. But, but, but what I wanted to talk about today is, um, is the, the fact that there are two forms of political blackness operating here, right? Olivia leaves, um, and yet um, Dido is the one that wants to establish a home for Olivia and herself where they both have the recognition they deserve, right? This, she's the one that's orchestrating that marriage plot, right? It's not a marriage plot that is involved in Olivia's oppression. It's a marriage plot that is kind of rebelling against this notion that blackness does not belong in British society, yeah? And I see her involvement, you know, I, this came out of a reading with my graduate students where they were saying, oh, she's just, you know, further oppressing her by getting her to marry. Doesn't she know she doesn't want to get married? Why is she trying to push her in to get married to this man, right? Um, and, and I had to take another look at it and think, well, you know, why does Dido want that? That bunch of keys that she repeatedly talks about, right, is a sign of something, right? It's a sign of her ascendancy into this, in this society. It's a sign of the fact that she's liberated, that she has a position, that she is validated within this household, that she has somebody who can protect her from this society. There's, there's a lot that Dido gets from being in England. And, and the reason why I think she is sort of this rebel, try to talk about her as this rebellious uh, participant in Black British literature is, is because she's doing the things that Olivia, because of her class position, 
cannot do, right? Mm -hmm. She can speak out and say a cursed white. She can uh, rebel against all forms of politeness, right? She can express herself openly um, in a way in which Olivia cannot. And we have to wait 200 years um, for people like Linton Cressy Johnson, the dub poet Linton Cressy Johnson, Benjamin Zephaniah, um, who are these performance poets who are doing what, uh, what Dido is actually doing years before, speaking in dialect, um, eschewing politeness, doing all of that stuff, right? And so the point I'm trying to make and what I want to tell your students is, think about Dido as the kind of early progenitor of a kind of black British identity that is claiming its home in England, trying to build its home in England, validating it, and doing so in a language that might seem inferior, but is all her own, yeah? Thank you. There are several questions that make sense based on our series um, that are about, I think it's probably highly speculative about whether Jane Austen would have known about this novel, um, whether we, whether you think that um, this novel, if she did know it, would have had some influence on how she depicted Miss Lamb in Sanditon. Um, so can you say anything about that? Or maybe you do know. Um, uh, I'd love to see the records for the uh, circulating library near, near which Jane Austen lived. It would be, it would be very interesting. Um, you check that this, this summer. <laughs> oh, please do, please do and see if there's a copy there. Um, um, I, I have no idea whether Jane Austen had read this. Um, 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 and, and as for um, the connections to, to Miss Lamb in Sanditon, um, uh, the, the, the one thing is, is, is Jane Austen's sort of imprecise about her, her use of, um, of terminology associated with, with Miss Lamb, right? What she calls her a half, a half- Half mulatto. Half mulatto, right? Mm -hmm. um, and my advisor, uh, Claudia Johnson, has always been un unnerved by that, right? Because, because, she, because Austen is very precise in her language. Um, and so, all of those racial classifications I gave you, mulatto, octoroon, quadroon, mesti, there, there's, there's a whole slew of things that she had. And granted, Sanditon isn't finished, right? It's a novel in progress. But, but half mulatto, what, what does that mean? It, it's a very weird term. Oh. And, so, and so I admire, I really do admire the fact that Austin was really thinking about uh, having a, a, a character of color as an important part of one of her one of her novels, um, but as I've been thinking about this notion of political blackness, right, and this is another th reason why I think it was written by a, a, a woman, is that I always turn to um, to Mantle Park, right, and Fanny Price's representation. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to make it clear: I'm not saying that Fanny is in any way a person of African descent. But, but what I do think is that she has, that, that she's read in a way that, that her complexion is read in a way as, as somebody who's inferior, somebody who's an outsider to this culture, somebody who's an observer, somebody who doesn't belong, right? And, and so there's a, there's a kind of parallel discourse that aligns um, Fanny with a person of African descent also on the outside of this privileged culture. And, and the reason why I say that is, is that, um, that, that Jane Austen is obviously thinking about the ways in which women are on the outsides of these cultures, right? Whether they are lower class women like Fanny or a character like Miss Lamb, who's on the outside of that culture as well. Um, so, so I admire the fact that the Austen is, is thinking about those women, trying to, to, to kind of define and make a space for those women, um, even as she has the sparkling heroines that we all love. Would you, what would you say about someone in her demographic? at least. So even if we don't know if Austin herself would have read the book, does she sort of fit the demographic of a person who would have encountered the book? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, you know, the, the, I, that I do not know. Um, I, I do often think about who the readership for the woman of color is, right? Um, who, who is Olivia aiming, aiming at? And, and, uh, and, um, and the, the, that, that curious ending right, the, the, the conversation, the conversation between the editor and a friend, right, the editor and the friend said, well, yep, yeah, who's going to buy this? She hasn't had a, a great ending for her, right? She's kicked out of the country. Um, and, and they say that this, this text is not doing that work of marriage, it's actually undermining that, it's doing something else, right? And so, again, I didn't mention this, but, but if a text is coming out 
in, in, the, in the wake of the abolition of the slave trade, Olivia's text is saying, you know, there's more work to do. That ma this marriage thing is not that important. How, how can I get um, my heroine involved in, in, in this euphoria associated with the, with the abolition of the slave trade? And I think the text is doing that work. So, so maybe the text is appealing to um, um, people who are interested in the abolition of slavery, right? Um, people, women who are committed to that um, and who, um, who need a, a kind of model for them to, to cohere around, to, to kind of validate, right? Um, maybe that's the readership. Um, and maybe Austin would be part of that demographic, right? The, the, the fact that she uh, identifies um, Fanny Price as somebody who, who advocates for slaves by bringing it up at the, at the breakfast table. Um, if there's a connection, I've just thought about it, if there's a connection between Fanny and um, Olivia, it's, it's that polite breakfast table dinner, breakfast dinner that Olivia has where, she, where the bowl of rice comes out. And the fact that Fanny brings up the slave trade, right? At, at, I think, I don't know, I can't remember if it's a meal or, but she brings it up some, somehow. Mm -hmm. And their dislike for uh, indolent women with pugs on their laps. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so back to that, you, you, you've spoken so interestingly about the ending um, and a couple of our listeners are thinking about that too. Um, you know, I'm struck by the circular plot, right? Of, of, of Bali starting in Jamaica and returning to Jamaica and, um, you know, and I've, discussed with students a little bit about what, what do you make of that circularity? Is that in itself a statement against the possibility of progress? Or is the return so different um, that it actually has, uh, you know, expresses a kind of optimism? I mean, her language is very strong when she says, I shall again zealously engage myself in ameliorating the situation and in instructing the minds and mending the morals of our poor Blacks, she says. Um, so, so can you say a little bit more about, because you said you were hope, you hoping that she would go back and do abolitionist work, yes. um, but is, is that so far-fetched? No. Um, but you also said that she's being kicked out of British society and I didn't actually get the sense that she was kicked out. So can you just, yeah. just a little bit more please on that? I may, have, I may have misspoken, I said she's kicked out because I, I did mean that, that she makes a choice to leave, right? I, did, I, I was saying that. So if I, if I said that, I apologize. Okay. But, but I, I like the, the kind of circular way in which you're thinking about it, right? The, the, the idea is, is that she's going back uh, an empowered black woman, right? 60,000 pounds, her inheritance has been restored to her. Um, she has the social credibility of being a widow, right? That she's gonna, that's not gonna tie her to any of these um, West Indian men who are after her. Uh, and she has this mandate, as you said, where she's going to zealously engage herself with the black people um, that she has an affinity with. So, so I, I agree, it's, it's, there's something about this, this text that says that, that she's gonna go and do some real work, right? Uh, in the plantation. Um, but but, but the, the, the talk that I gave today was about, well, what, what about the black people in England, right? Like, what about, what's she leaving behind? And, and again, I wanna make it clear, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I think they're both doing political blackness in different ways, right? I mean, different locations, but but I but I also want to give credit to Dido, who is trying to establish something um, behind, something within Britain, right? That yeah. because it's within Britain, maybe more rebellious, because you know they want to to sort of ship the the black people out to the West Indies, right? Um, so so I like the idea in which you're talking about a circular thing, a, a circular kind of um, structure to the. To the story and to Olivia's journey, um, but but I but I also see it as a as a, a kind of a, a kind of triumphant journey, in the sense that she is she's you know she's being shipped off by her father's will at, at the opening of the of the of the thing, but but she leaves by her own choice. She makes a different decision, and if you think about that, that says that you know that that she's definitely you know, a different person, a transformed person by the time she goes back. So it's circular, but, but, but the circle is broken <laughs> by, yeah. her, by her going back with money. Well, she has that, the first, first volume, it seems like she's constantly talking about her father, oh, deifying the father. And then, then she starts deifying the husband, but by the end she 
I mean, I guess it's just, it's her and God in a way. Um, <laughs> that It's true, right. it's her and God, it, yeah. it, it is. I mean, that's it, it, it really is. Um, and, and, and who can imagine what she's doing out there? I mean, whether you know, could imagine what she's doing, it, whatever she's doing, I know she's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> it's so difficult to come to this book I mean, I, it, it is such a mystery. It has to be exciting for you to work on a book that is a mystery in this way. So there is a thread, there's a subtext. We're amateur detectives here who are determined to solve this mystery for the author is. And um, there are a few questions on you saying something about the publication history, what we know about the publisher, what other books they might've published and what we might be able to infer about the author based on the publisher. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And so, and so, as I say in the introduction, the, the, you know, this book was attributed to um, a woman who had a number of, of novels out. Um, and so that might have been a way to kind of sell the novel, right? <laughs> Talking about who the demographic might be. Um, somebody might have said, oh, I've read Miss Bayfield's thing. Let me pick up this woman of color thing because I know the kind of style that she writes in, right? So it's a, it's a kind of easy marketing technique, an easy marketing tool. Um, but, but in, um, in the, the people who've done research on these novels say that Mrs. Bayfield couldn't have written all of those things in that particular year, right? It's impossible to write uh, 18 novels in that one year. So, so they're saying that it's a, a kind of marketing strategy. Um, um, the, 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 maybe the only thing I can, else, other thing I can say about it is, uh, is, that, is that when the novel comes out, um, it, it, can I say this? It, 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 may be, it may be appealing to a certain demographic, right? It may be written for a person who's interested in the abolition of slave trade, but I'm also hoping that it's, it's, it's gonna appeal to, I mean, think about the title, The Woman of Color, right? I'm hoping it's gonna appeal to, um, to women who are, um, who are looking for sort of more Wollstonecraftian texts, right? Um, texts like The Victim of Prejudice, right? Um, which is a story about a white woman who is also an outsider because of her class and because um, that she is you know, brutally violated and stigmatized as sexually licentious for, for that reason. Um, and so I'm hoping that, that, that this text is, by its title, is also encouraging you know, women to, to kind of buy it and, 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 and read it not because it's written by a particular author, but because it's, it's, it's kind of like identifying you know, something that women should, should want to read, right? It's about a woman of color. I mean, you can't be more clear in the title than that. Right? <laughs> so, so that's what I'd say. Um, so there are several people following up on the marriage question. Um, so uh, more, do, more, why do you think, um, since there what would have been, uh, it would have been uh, more conventional, of course, to have this story end in, an, in end in marriage. But why why does the author have um, Olivia uh, end up both without a marriage and also without a child? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, again, I think I think Olivia not marrying um, is a, a way in which the author is trying to point out the the, the you know the 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 fact that the the you know, that she's going to do better work. She's going to do bigger things, right? Um, she's going to be a kind of advocate in the, in the colonies in, the, in, in Jamaica. Um, and, I'm, and I also wanna, you know, I've mentioned the, the victim of prejudice. I also wanna think about that text as a text that seems to be uh, against this notion of marriage, against the idea that women uh, of any race at this time have to be dependent on men, right? Um, and how that dependency actually creates a system where men are more oppressive to the women, right? Because they know that women have to be dependent on them, you know? Um, that, that this text, texts like The Woman of Color, texts like The Victim of Prejudice, um, even uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's work, the, the fact that they are pushing against the idea that marriage is the only viable solution for women says that, you know, there's work that women can do, that women are doing to be more independent for themselves and to do more work not only for themselves, but on behalf of slaves, yeah? Um, the second question about, about no children um, is an interesting one because Augustus has a child, right? He has a child with Angelina um, and, and she, she brings that family together, yeah? Um, 
but but she is not reproducing. And so the, the, the thing that I, that I, I find really interesting, I, I mentioned it in the talk that Augustus is the image of uh, her father, right? And whenever I teach it, I always say there's something, there's something remarkably icky about the fact that she's marrying this guy. She's not only marrying this man who looks like her father, but he has to take the father's name, right? And so the father seems to want to reproduce himself in the body of Augustus so that I, Augustus can then reproduce and whiten or lighten his, his line, right? And so Livia saying, I'm not gonna get married, I'm not gonna reproduce, I'm just gonna use whatever I can to advocate for slavery, says that she's not gonna be participating in that thing that her father wants, right? It's not that she can't find love, but she's not, she's not participating in the idea that she's merely somebody who's going to lighten or whiten um, her familial line as her father wanted. So I see it as an act of rebellion maybe, that she doesn't have any kids. Mm -hmm. There's a great question here about speech patterns. So there's always, I know I do American literature, there's always a politics to the way that people of color speech patterns get um, get included in a text, whether it's vernacular or whatever. So do you, uh, let's see, were Dido's speech patterns typical or realistic of the time uh, as a slave from that part of the world? Um, um, so um, really good question. I'm not a linguist. I don't. I don't know. I can't answer that specifically. But but what I can say is, um, if you read um, um, it's a poem by uh, Amelia Opie. Um, I think the ne is it the Negro Boy's Tale, uh, something along those lines. A, a, a large section. It's written in 1802, but I'm, I'm blanking on the title. Um, a large section of that text is written in dialect. Uh, English dialect, and um, and it's no way near as um, readable as what we what I read what I read to you today, right? Um, uh, the, the it's it's it seems forced. It seems um, um, she it seems like she's using it to fit into a kind of iambic rhythm, right? Rather than trying to understand the speech patterns of um, of somebody who comes from Jamaica at this particular time. Um, so I can't answer your question definitively. I'm not sure um, how Jamaican Black people, enslaved Black people spoke at this particular time, but I do know that there's something different about, say, the use of that kind of dialect in, in a poem that's doing some kind of work for a particular reason and the way in which Dido speaks in, in this text. Is, that the, is it a story by Amelia Opie? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we probably only have time for maybe one other question. Uh, I have one from um, Brenda here, who's asking uh, about the uh, about the evangelicals and Methodists, um, and to what extent you know she these uh, the author is try is engaging in the same kind of um, mission of humanizing Black people for the sake of uh, abolition and just greater compassion. That's a really good question. And that's something I, I, I really should do more work on, the sort of religious angle of the text, because it's such a it's such a kind of crucial side of it. I have to say I don't know as much about it as I as I should do. Um, but I but I do think that that, that this text is um, is grounding itself in a religious discourse that that is trying to um, to recognize Olivia's inner disposition, right? And by that I'm saying that. Um, remember I talked about uh, Roxanne Wheeler and the categories of difference. What, what I was trying to suggest there is that there are these older definitions of thinking about um, difference, right? One of which was um, one's religion could play an important way in, what, in which one, people distinguish themselves from each other. And, but, I, but I think that what happened in the latter part of the 18th century is that some writers like the author Woman of Color are still using religion in a way that, sh that, that is trying to identify the inner disposition, the inner complexion of this particular character. And that's how I came at the, at the, no at the novel. Um, how is it using religion in order to say, don't focus on my, you know, my phenotype, focus on my inner complexion, because that's the thing that connects us all together, you know? Um, and so it, so it seems to be inhabiting, sorry, not inhabiting, it seems to be drawing on 
an older discourse about race, about racial, about difference, basically, um, using this religious, um, this religious discourse. But, but, but in terms of getting into grips with, with, um, with Methodism and stuff like that, I, I really would love to do more of that. I just haven't done enough. Thank you. This was so great. I could sit for another hour and ask you more questions. <laughs> oh, this is great. Um, but for everyone's sake, we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much, Lyndon, for this engaging presentation and discussion. Um, and thank you to everyone in our audience and everyone who asked questions. Please stick around as we are about to tell you more about our exciting new creative writing workshops. We would also like to take this moment to thank our sponsors for this program, including the Orange County Arts Commission and North Carolina Cares, Chapel Hill Public Library, and the Humanities for the Public Good Initiative at UNC Chapel Hill, who provided us with a critical issues grant to partially support this season's series. A word from our partners, the Chapel Hill Public Library. Hi everyone, Maya can't join us this evening, but uh, I wanna pass on a message from her. On behalf of the town of Chapel Hill and the library, we are especially excited to announce a special contest for all ages. The contest is titled, A Truth Universally Re-Acknowledged, A Pride and Prejudice Writing Contest. Imagine Jane Austen's beloved story in a new context, real or imagined, and submit your 500 to 1,000 word adaptation of the first scene or chapter of Pride and Prejudice for a chance to win admission to the Jane Austen Summer Program, which you'll hear more about in just one minute. Um, submissions are due May 10th. Our judges are Martha Waters, our author of To Have and To Hoax, Susan Brown, the director of the Chapel Hill Public Library, and Sonia Kamal, author of Unmarriageable. Please see chapelhilllibrary.org slash writing contest, the URL here at the bottom of your screen. Um, the contest is open to anyone of any ages, and you can email Maya James at M James at townofchapelhill.org if you have any questions. And thank you to everyone who registered for JASP this summer. We are sold out. We are so thrilled that over 250 of you are going to be joining us this June. Um, so please be on the lookout for Shakespeare and Jane Austen in 2022. So the only way actually to go to JASP this summer if you haven't registered is to win that writing contest. Yes. Another reason to enter. <laughs> um, and before you leave, we would like to announce the, the last, oh, the, sorry, not the last, no, no, but the next two programs for the Race in the Regency series. So in just a few days on April 13th, we'll hear from Damianne Scott with her talk about Bridgerton. Bridgerton's Queen Charlotte is playing to the masses and it's about time. Then on April 27th, we'll be welcoming Gretchen Garzina, who'll be talking about the black woman in 19th century studies. And you can find as usual, full details and the registration on our website, janeaustinandco.org. Uh, we'd really like to thank everybody who came tonight. We had nearly 200 people here from Chile, South Africa, uh france uk canada and all over the us so thank you so much for being here um and if you did enjoy tonight's programming please consider making a donation to the jane austen summer program if you're in the us uh where you can it's tax deductible because we are a registered nonprofit, um, and it helps us keep these events free and open to the public and they let us bring in great speakers like eb zoboy and lyndon dominique they also, you may not know this, but our, the, our donations also go to supporting middle and high school teachers whom we give scholarships to uh, for attending JASP and for um, gaining more, edu more uh, pedagogical training in how to teach earlier writers. So you can help us work towards greater historical literacy and another generation of readers of works like The Woman of Color and, and Jane Austen. Thank you all once again for attending and we hope you remain healthy and safe until we meet again. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Lyndon. Thank you, Lyndon. Enjoy the weekend. See you next week, everybody. Bye. <laughs>